I started at Blizzard in early uh, 2017. I came from um, TV animation, and so there was a little bit of that nervousness of like, this is a whole different world of how they do things here. When I first got assigned a show, it was for Old Soldier. We shot a lot of the more dramatic moments um, live, with live reference. Like it was Mark and uh, one of the animators, and we'd go outside, and the previous artist, he took his camera and he was like, filming them as they're acting out all these scenes. Well, you know, Joanna and I started working together immediately. You know, we didn't even meet beforehand, to my memory. You know, honestly, I think we hit it off right away. I think the first thing that happened uh, after being assigned on the project was I got invited to um, one of the story rooms, and I didn't know what to expect. I think I just assumed I was going to just be sitting in on a script read or just kind of a, a passive observer just kind of watching people discuss it. Um, and so I went, not really knowing what I was walking into, and then they, they, they read the, the script. And then immediately after finishing, like I just saw all these heads turn to me and they were like, what do you think? And I was like, oh, not a passive observer. This is like, uh, they want my input. For me, it was like the validation of like, this is why I wanted to come here, is to have that, that input on these kind of shows. Well, I think that there were already rumblings from different corners that for as good our collaboration was, maybe it could be better. Maybe there were areas where we still weren't getting the full uh, connection from people, or maybe there were people that felt left out and just weren't saying anything. And so that was on my mind. I think that was on a lot of people's mind and, and we wanted to do something about it. Um, and I think you know, that is a big part of you know, what led to the story strike team. I remember leaving that meeting like, okay, all right, this is like an active partnership working on this piece. You know, like um, they, they care about my voice and what I'm going to bring to the table. I think there needs to be an explicit invitation, you know, to speak your mind and to be comfortable in uh, committing yourself to the process, to the project, to uh, making it yours, to saying, you know, this isn't just Mark's movie or Blizzard's movie, it's my movie too, right? And that's what I think, you know, we tried to do with Old Soldier, and I think that's what we continue to try to do today, to speak from the heart, um, because it makes us a better work group, and it makes the movies better. That's the bottom line. Hey everybody, um, my name is Matt Cohan. I manage the writing team in story and franchise development at Blizzard Entertainment, which is a game company. Are, are there any gamers here? All right. And Blizzard fans, I hope, also. All right, so I said story and franchise development, we call it SFD, which is pretty unique in the games business. It's a studio within Blizzard designed to create a lot of content that stands inside and outside the games, including cinematics. And today we have a panel here, we're gonna talk about how we build those cinematics. Um, and we have a few folks here from a variety of disciplines to represent their role in the strike teams that we use to create them. Um, we saw in that video a director, Mark Messenger, and an editor, Joanna Grable, neither of whom could be here today, but in their shoes and other shoes too. We have some others who are gonna introduce themselves to you now. Hello Lightbox, my name is Brian Horn. I'm a cinematic director. I've been at Blizzard for 14 years. Uh, I am Kirsten Van Est. I'm an associate producer in creative development and I've been with Blizzard about two years now. Hi guys, my name is Andrew Robinson. I am one of the writers for story and franchise development. Hi, um, hi my name is Ari Yoon. I'm a storyboard artist with the uh, SFT, and I've been working for around three to four years. Hi there, my name is John Tier. I'm the previs and camera supervisor in SFD, and I've been with Blizzard for almost 13 years now. Hi everybody, my name is Jake Patton. I'm an editor and the animation editorial supervisor, and I've also been at Blizzard for 13 and a half years. And just so you don't feel deprived of how long I've been there, 
Uh, I've been there for nine years. So collectively, we have 560 years of experience <laughs> assembled for you. Um, so Joanna in the video mentioned that one thing that she noticed almost immediately at Blizzard was a major difference from something she'd seen in her prior roles. She was brought into a story room early on. Um, we call those strike teams, um, but it, we didn't always have those at Blizzard, uh, where I've only been for almost three years now. I'd love to talk about what it was like before, just so we can establish sort of a baseline. Yeah, sure. So when I started, um, Blizzard was a lot smaller. We, ha we made fewer games at a time, and we produced less content in a year. Um, so we had maybe like four directors, um, doing cinematics, but the way we are set up organizationally, which Matt mentioned, is like we service a handful of different game teams. So we're set up to always be making things, which I think is different than like if you were on a TV show or a film, where it's you set up sticks for the one show and then you're done. Um, we're constantly generating content. And so I think because of that setup, <clears throat> the way it was in the old days was, or semi-old days, was uh, we would have all these disciplines, like the team you see assembled here, as sort of like a constellation or you know, around the director and producer and a couple other folks, sort of bouncing around to each of these disciplines, communicating what they want or trying to share like, hey, I pitched this to the game teams. So I, as a director, I'm responsible for making sure they get what I pitched them and keep it exciting for them and trying to keep that communication going, um, setting priorities, things like that. And so that's how things were in the old days. I don't know if any of you want to elaborate. Yeah, from a, from a writer's perspective, I come from the world of television animation, uh, just like Ari and, and Joanna. In fact, Joanna, uh, who you saw in the video, was my animatic editor on a show that I produced for Hasbro um, at least 10 years ago. Um, and the way that we had worked in television animation was it was script-driven. Um, not a frame was boarded until the script had been signed off by the uh, network. And then that process would go forward like a, you know, tr cars on a train. Um, when I arrived at Blizzard, it was more of a board-driven uh, uh, scenario. And so there was a transference or, you know, we began to do more of a script-driven um, uh, way of working. And it was still a handoff. Um, so the script would be signed off on, and then the, the um, director and the board artist would go off and do Blue Sky and come back. And then we had a group of people examining, you know, how did it change? Do we need to realign? Uh, and then finally it would go, after the boards had all been done, it would, it would finally go to editorial. And sometimes changes would happen in editorial. And it would come back, and we would examine whether we needed to realign. And Obviously, you know, you guys have seen Blizzard videos. They're phenomenal. The, we uh, set the standard for the industry for, uh, for what it's worth, I think. Um, but as we said, there was always that question, as Mark said, of can we, is there a better way to do this? Can we align more early and often? And I had a, a personal revelation when we were trying to, uh, to solve a problem. Uh, I don't, if you guys have seen uh, Rise and Shine, the May cinematic for Overwatch, where she's, she knows what she has to do, but she's unable to do it. And we were discussing, like, how do we solve that? And one of our board artists and directors now, who is here with us, um, can I say his name? No. Mike Koizumi, was, uh, he's here, was drawing on post-its and we were going, we, we just couldn't solve it. And he held up a post-it note and there was the moment that May is faced with the, uh, you know, in the open door and she's faced with the Arctic wasteland and she, her, her boots are at the threshold and she cannot force herself to go over the threshold and she turns around and we were like, oh my God, that's so emotional. And I realized, I want these guys in earlier. Um, and. I think that we, we started that process a little bit then. Cool. Uh, how did the siloing that I'm hearing you talk about from the, the sort of old, more linear, conventional way affect editorial and previous? Yeah, so basically to that point, like the, the relationship of the editor and director 
is really strong and really tight. And uh, when we were in this sort of old way of doing things, we'd have the director sort of leave editorial and go to the writer, go to the board artist, and go to uh, the producer and, and come back to editorial. And then we'd talk, and it just became this weird shell game messaging thing. And, you know, uh, it was really clear, at least at least to myself and my other editors, like, hey, there's got to be a better, better way to have the production, pre-production staff more a part of this tight-knit group and to experience uh, more uh, or have, bring their experiences more to the table of what could make this piece uh, that much better. And I think we, we all sort of had that feeling. We just weren't necessarily sure how to execute and make that a reality across our different projects. Because as Brian mentioned, we had a, quite a few projects moving at different paces, different schedules, different groups for different you know, clients or clients being the game team. So uh, we just never really found that sort of moment of like how to piece that together and, and really sort of corral the groups into a more sustainable creative juggernaut. And for us in previs, sort of on the very tail end of the overall pre-production process, what we were finding is that when the pipeline was more linear, and the content was moving in a more discreetly linear way between script to storyboards, then to animatic, and then to previs, that a substantial quantity of the creative and story-based decisions were already done by the time it got to us. And so for us, you know, previs is a very foundational act of filmmaking, setting up the staging and the environment, the blocking of the characters, the cameras, the lensing. All of those choices that we need to make in that space are informed by the story, but the workflow that we previously had was preventing us from having access to the story when it was in a more malleable form. And so we were largely kind of, the, we were a little bit more locked in and we were just finding that there was a real hunger on our side to get more involved earlier so that some of the ideas we had around the filmmaking and the shooting of the, you know, the lensing of the piece needed to be happening earlier alongside the story development. Um, and so we were feeling that a lot and then was having conversations with Mark, the director from the video, about the need for that and um, and then we kind of moved into a slightly different process around this afterward. Yeah, one other, just wanted to say one other thing about that process earlier on. We, uh, when a director was working with a storyboard artist to come up with, okay, here's how it's gonna go, they would even edit a lot of times, then it would move to editorial, move to writing, you know, through these stages, the why, the, the, the decision making behind the very first choices kind of like got lost a little bit. Like the director might remember, the, the editor might remember, but really like as it went down the pipeline, um, there was, it could add to a lot of confusion. Yeah, it was like context was missing and would, there was attempts to try to recall when there would be those return meetings and, mm -hmm. and, and you just, you know, like, well, I think that was, I think that's what we said, I think that's what we said, but I can't, let's go talk to them. And they're like, well, I don't really remember. And so we were missing out on opportunities. I think it was also putting a lot of onus on the director to continually reconvey a lot of the same information in different sort of spaces. Um, and, and that a little bit of telephone game was emerging from that. Um, and then I think to the overall point of like recall of why some choices were made, whereas context that maybe teams further downstream were missing at times. That's really cool. So it sounds like you were, we were spending a lot of time and energy creating this great content. We were proud of the content but there was this sort of groundswell of feeling that maybe we were missing something, that there was some secret sauce that we could have added to improve everyone's experience, maybe improve the workflow, and improve the final project as well. Um, awesome, okay, so I've sort of detected like the beginnings of a definition of a strike team. I think like the driest possible is sort of an early stage room where different artists from different uh, disciplines and experience and expertise are brought together early. So a writer, a director, producer, editor, board artist, previs representative. Um, it's not previs representative, is it? <laughs> <laughs> the wizard there. Um, come together. But I'd love to hear a more like human version of that definition from someone who's, who's been in them and, and managed them and participated. So uh, yeah, so we, it's essentially that. I mean, like, we, we want to take everyone's, you know, as a, as a director, I'll just be the selfish one for a minute. Like, I want to extract everyone's expertise and leverage it to the, to the greatest possible extent on my pieces, right? And so I think, 
as a way, and I also get tired of explaining the same thing over and over again. <laughs> so putting everyone in a room, getting them all together, and everyone kind of workshopping it. The way I like to think about it is that scene in Apollo 13 where they dump all the parts onto the table and they're like, okay, we have to make an air filter out of these things and we have 30 minutes or whatever it is. Um, it feels like that and the energy, the energy contributes significantly to what we're making. Yeah, I would say too, from a production side of things, uh, this process really helps because when everyone is in the room at the same time, able to give their ideas and are invited to give their ideas, I think of production like the black box of the airplane. So if the plane goes down, which thankfully it hasn't so far, but if it does, um, I can be kind of a living, walking history of everything that's happened in the room. And on top of that, with everyone in the room at every stage, it, kind of helps you guys and it helps us that you're all hearing the ideas as they come out. So we're not having to repeat ideas that maybe didn't work in the past. And on the other side of that, if we need to solve a problem and we're not sure what to do about it, there may have been an idea that was pitched weeks ago that could be the exact solve for what we're looking for right now. So production folks and those that were in the room before can be like, well, what about this thing that Ari pitched like, you know, last month? And that could be exactly what we need now that the story has changed. Uh, yeah, um, like my experience um, in this strike team was, um, I'm, first of all, I came from TV animation, so I'm so used to the, I guess, even the Blizzard's like previous pipeline of just like, yeah, like the whole linear like trail of like a, like a train uh, going through the tracks. And I've gotten so used to, my brain was just wired to that. So when I first came and then they asked for my feedback on the story, I was like kind of frozen, I was like, what? They want my input, like, I, I feel so like honored, but also I don't know what to say. Um, but, um, but it was really awesome for being in a, like a safe space of like just, even if it's like a dumb idea, no one's gonna like, judge you. They're gonna still find it interesting and maybe that's like a good point to jump on something like a new ideas. So it was awesome to um, not be, not feel like I had to be in a lane, like or, or stay in my like lane or stay in my room kind of thing. Um, and also, it's just really great to explore ideas with everyone, with like, you know, everyone's brain and to just mesh into one. So it was like really fun. Yeah, that's something I noticed that's pretty unique about Blizzard as well, because in my experience, production is very like time and budget oriented. But coming to Blizzard, it was like, like Ari was saying, and like Joanna said in the video, they want to know your feedback if you're in that room. And that was something that I found very unique and I think is really helpful because even though we're all in our own disciplines, sometimes it helps to get an outside point of view to be like, this is working for me or this isn't. And then the person whose role it is in the room to help solve that is able to kind of get that feedback in real time. And, um, there, to that point and, and to what Ari said, there's one of the tenets of Blizzard's values is that every voice matters. And it's never more true than it is in our creative space that the strike team is composed of different disciplines, but everybody who's in that room deserves to be in that room and is not only welcome to voice their opinion, but is expected to voice their opinion uh, because the most creative solves can come from anywhere. Uh, and it is not just on the writer to solve a script problem. Somebody can, anybody can suggest a piece of dialogue or a turn, a plot turn. And the, the important thing is not as a writer, that's my job. The important thing is what's the best thing for the project? What's, you know, and, and I think as a result, while we all own our disciplines, we have become through the, the, the experience of the strike team, we, have, we hold them less tightly. We acknowledge that everybody can contribute to uh, something that is not our specialty. Um, and, and that has been my experience. The first time I was you know, in an edit bay uh, on, a, on a show and, and uh, the director said, should we cut in earlier here? And I was like, you know, if, like a couple of seconds, if you trim here, you can make that scene move more quickly. And maybe if you put the camera there, and I would never been allowed to do that. And the fact that they took that note was amazing. 
it made me feel like I had a role beyond, all right, the script is done, goodbye bye bye. Mm -hmm. uh, even to the, to the degree of being allowed to voice direct scratch track to increase the, you know, this is what was in my head. It's really gonna help the emotional moment if you say it like this and I don't, you know, you try not to give them the read, but it's scratch track. Um, so yeah, uh, everybody contributes. I, I'm just speaking from the editorial perspective, which you know, I, I like to view, view editorial as the injection point of all these ideas. And you know, once we get past sort of this, the, the rigidity of what I think a lot of people experience outside of Blizzard can be stay in your lane, stay in your discipline. But in this space, what we were trying to achieve is like all of you artists, all of you have different experiences. You have different upbringings, different perspectives on the world around you. And when you can bring more of that into the space to speak to some of the stories or characters we're trying to put in these circumstances or situations to make our players, our fans, feel something. It's a lot easier to do when you have a diverse amount of viewpoints than it does two people in an edit bay, a director and an editor. It's, I mean, you can come up with some cool stuff, we've done that, but I think it's important to you know, really capitalize on what Kirsten's experiences bring to the table, what Andrew's experiences, and all these different things to really see what resonates with the group, because that's, you know, more times than not, it's gonna, we're gonna find something really special in that moment. Okay, so this seems like a pretty dramatic shift where suddenly now the floodgates are open to all kinds of new voices coming into the story dev process. So I'm wondering um, how you keep the balance between our commitment to inclusivity, but also our need to stay on time and keep the forward momentum of our projects going. You, Kirsten, used the word invitation earlier. We heard it from Mark earlier. What is bound up? Like, what responsibilities are bound up in the idea of being invited into one of these rooms? Well, I, guess, I guess what you're getting at is, um, like, all this sounds great, and it's great to throw ideas around and to have everyone pitch in, and like, oh, that's really cool, and that's really cool. But without some kind of, you know, boundaries or borders, we'll just spend, we'll spend years, and we'll never make anything. So. The idea is like we made a commitment to the game team. We have budgetary and schedule commit, you know, constraints we got to hit, um, and so those things are obviously at play. And the director and producer are the, kind of the the ones who are in charge of those things. Um, but I think it's it's up to us to invite those other things into invite people to like like Mark had said um, to pull people into it and to pull ideas out of them because sometimes. Some people are very free with their ideas and they're just idea generating machines and they may have like a thousand things, but there's one person sitting back thinking, I I'm not gonna throw mine out, it's, it's stupid compared to that guy's or whatever. Um, but uh, what we've seen a lot is when you pull that out of someone and you give them the space to share that, um, that actually we can leverage that. Even it may work and they were wrong or it doesn't work, but it leads us to the right thing. Um, so anyway. I, I bet everyone in the room here is, has been in uh, a situation where they go like, all right, this is a terrible idea, but. <laughs> and sometimes that idea is the key. Sometimes it's not the key, but it might spark the discussion that leads to the solve. So we say there are no bad ideas uh, in the sense that even that, and I'm famous for like, I have a terrible idea and it's honestly terrible, but it might start us talking about the thing that works um, and that's valuable in itself. Circling back to the idea of the invitation being really important, I think it's the invitation to the room, but also the invitation to participate in the room. Because just being in a meeting is, can, I think that's easy to interpret as a passive observer of the, what's happening in the meeting and the creative conversations, but being prompted explicitly for your feedback is important. And I think an important thing too is we're talking about a space where a lot of ideas are being exchanged and you know terrible ideas are being thrown out as they may be framed. But um, one thing that can come up in that room that I think is a real challenge is what if you disagree with everybody else in the room? Mm. And it's really hard to find a voice in that kind of moment. And so that's where an invitation can actually help you kind of like, you know what, I'm gonna say something that's contrary to what everybody else in this room is vibing on like for a story right now. And just to share an anecdote that Mark has shared with me since he's not here today, the first time we were doing the Story Strike team, 
and they had gone through a lot of development, a lot of reference shooting, and kind of like had an, an edit they were really happy with. And then the previous artist uh, said, I don't buy it. Like, the story isn't resonating for me because of this particular turn. And Mark's anecdote was it was really hard to hear that. <laughs> and it was really hard to accept that, like, that was a very counter opinion. But they talked through it, and 15 minutes later, they had a better, a better story because they had addressed his underlying concern um, and come out better on the end of it. Agreed. And Mark relayed, like, when that comment came out, I don't buy it, he was kind of irritated. Like, we just spent weeks building this, and everybody else loves it. Why don't you love it? And he had to remind himself, this is what I asked for, and this is the proof of it. How do I respond to this? And uh, I think that was the moment of the key turning in the lock that opened the door to make us all realize, like, oh, yeah, this is going to be a thing. It really sets the tone for the room, though. Like, you have to be willing to you know, hear that feedback that, oh man, I really, we're, we're, we're done. What, we're, why are we here now? And then, it, and then you, you embrace it. And that's, that's the key to having these strike teams be successful and comfortable and why that when we're in these groups, because it's, it's a bunch of different people back at the, uh, the, the studio that will get thrust into these groups. Some are old, familiar colleagues and sometimes like, Hey, that person, like Joanna, she just started, and she's now in this room, and wow, everybody's looking at her. Like, it can be a little bit daunting, but I think it's important to make sure to, you know, make, normalize the room as far as, like, everybody's appreciated, everybody's expected to participate, but everybody is welcome, and if your bad idea, or you, you have a bad idea, it's not until uh, it becomes a good idea in your brain, because sometimes, like, they, they hit it at... This germ, like, ah, it's, I've, I've put so many bad ideas into play and they blossom into a saw through two or three people. Like, well, what, what if instead of that, it's this, and, it's, and you add this, and then the next thing you know, we've got an amazing so cinematic, like, old soldier. Yeah, just to, like, add on, add on to the whole, like, the invitation thing, um, I guess, personally, as I, I guess, I, I guess I call myself, like, very introverted person. I'm not very outgoing person to just like bring out ideas even though it might be good or whatever but um i uh, i think the room feels safe enough where even though i don't voice my opinion at the moment i can still like you know slack them or maybe bring them up bring the idea up in the uh, future meetings if i want to bring it up so i don't feel like i guess pressure to bring something to the table at the moment um yeah so everyone's really accommodating to what how everyone works and i really appreciate that I think it's important to acknowledge that everybody's going to engage with that kind of space in a different way. I think Brian said, like, there are some people who are just, like, they're like a fire hose of ideas, you know, and they're extroverted, and, like, they really engage with that space. But similarly, I'm kind of an introvert, and so some of my ideas may come in deep thought later, like shower thoughts, like, oh, I've got it. You know, and it's not even in the room, but then in the next session, you bring that idea in and, you know, discuss it. So I think acknowledging, too, that, like, different people need to engage with that space in a different way is important. Um, and to some degree, I know we've talked about, like, the director is kind of the person who's sort of the ultimate shot caller and sort of like helps steer this ship of where all these ideas are going because it's easy for them to run out in all different directions, but it's some of the director's job in the room to like guide all of that and keep everybody moving in a similar direction. Um, yeah, so it's just an and important I, part. And I think there's, there's a level of trust when you're in the strike team because, yeah, we have these meetings and these jam sessions, but it doesn't mean that the things stop, as, as John mentioned. Like, you go off from that and... You're ruminating, you're thinking, you've got, oh, I need to take that back to the group, or I need to hit the director in the hall. And, but, the, but the key is to bring it back to the group so the, the group can participate and share in that idea, that comments, that whatever it is, just so it's not, because we, we want to avoid the siloing. We want to avoid these sort of offshoot discussions if we can. Yeah, I, I think there's another benefit that I just thought of, which we hadn't talked about earlier, but like, um, you know, as a director, the way things used to be, the director would kind of hold everything in their head and carry it along as they talk to each of these people. The way we work now, with everyone in a room, jamming on it together, there's an added benefit, which is that each of, I work on the shows that I work on, and each of these folks work on different shows sometimes, like the casting rotates. So they are solving problems somewhere else 
that we may be encountering on this show right now that I've never encountered. And they may have solutions they can bring to the table for this that they've already solved. Or something that they did before that could work here that, you know, things like that. So there's like a leveraging of everyone's collective expertise and experience. Yeah, I would say too that that helps kind of keep the impetus going for the project to move forward because in all of this, you know, we take a lot of ideas in and it's really cool to hear everybody's thoughts, but at the end of the day, we kind of need a North Star and that is the director. And I think these rooms are really cool because they put everybody on the same team where before it might be like, mine is the gear or the piece that's gonna move this thing forward. Now it's how do we do this as a team and move in the direction we wanna go, which is pretty cool. And yet we all have our individual jobs to accomplish. Right. Out of that meeting, uh, you know, I'm gonna go write the script or the outline or the beat sheet or whatever it is. Irie has boards to do to, you know, if we're in, in boards or animatics, there may be a shift in, you know, how do we tell the scene different? John is gonna go, you know, set camera <laughs> and, and Jake is arranging the animatic. And, and so, and very frequently the lifeline uh, if Kirsten is in the meeting, she's not only contributing, but she's making sure that we don't forget everything. So the set of notes that comes out of that is the touchstone by which we operate. And we all make sure that we are responsible for, you know, not only contributing in the room, but do your job. <laughs> so that the next meeting, we've made progress. Awesome. It feels like this all works really well as long as people trust each other and respect each other, and maybe check their ego at the door. Um, when someone comes in new, either new to the company or new to the strike team for the first time, are there any tips that you give, anything you look out for, any specific things you try to model behavior-wise for them? You're looking at me, but, but like a lot, of, a lot of our directors actually are homegrown. I don't think we've ever hired a director straight out from outside. So most of the directors who are directing are marinated in this or, or in the organic growth of it to the point we're at now. So I haven't had to have a talk with anybody about anything. We have a, a conceptual thing called the rules of the writer's room and it is about extending trust. Um, again, if you're in the room, you deserve to be in the room. And for someone new, it may take a little while to sort of ramp up into that but uh, we try to model the, uh, the invitation, for example, that to make sure that somebody who's uh, quiet, are they being quiet because they're just absorbing material and they're sort of slowly percolating or are they waiting their turn and they need, but they don't feel comfortable enough in this room full of people who've been working together for five or seven or eight, 10 years to go like, eh? so, it's, uh, it's part of that for somebody, particularly with somebody who's new, we, the, the explicit invitation and the welcome. I think it's important as well, something that, I, I mean, I learned in the rooms and that I kind of encourage for any artists on my team who join the rooms is, it's a space that we want to set up explicitly to be an exchange of ideas and like that's the function of the room. But ultimately, um, and the idea is that you should be able to contribute contributions, you know, ideas, verbal pitch to any discipline. So, you know, if, if I have an idea for a, a line of dialogue or something. But I think there is still an important component, which is respecting the discipline expertise of every individual. No, words, words are mine. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and because, you know, like in, in the sense of like, I may provide a suggestion about a line of dialogue, but the idea isn't that I would go away and the next time we come back, I show up with a brand new script that I wrote, right? Any more than I would go away and re-edit what the editor is working on. Like we still wanna like allow people to like own their disciplines. Um, but the idea is that you can verbal pitch those ideas but not sort of like, yeah, grasp too much. You're, I think there's, a, far there's too a fine busy. line. You're far too busy to do a few. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I just, I just wanna say for a minute, like we're, we're painting this picture like it's idyllic but a lot of these things we're talking about we've gone through and we've learned from experience. So some of those examples John has made were our lives in the past, but we've been like, oh, yeah, we don't do that now. We know that that doesn't work. And so anyway, I just wanted to say that. But. All right, cool. I'm imagining that a lot of strike teams, maybe ideally, maybe not happen in like a big jam session sitting around the table, but 
It doesn't work in a work from home model or hybrid work model or sometimes work from home, sometimes in the office model, which I guess is a hybrid. Uh, how do we do it? What tools are we using to like stay on top of things in, in our current mode? Um, I think it, we leave it kind of up to the director or the team to kind of guide exactly how we're going to do things on a show. Um, when we were prior to everyone working from home, we would generally the location was the edit, the edit bay because you could see everything. Um, not all directors worked that way, and I think it switched, it depended. But um, you could just funnel everything through the edit. We could switch through things. We're all looking at the same screen. But then when we're at home, um, now everyone has their own screen. And so we can kind of view things from everyone's computer. So um, yeah, they yeah, both work. When we were breaking a story for the first time, you know, a game team would come to us with a need. We need to tell a story about the X character or this expansion. So the, the first of it would be, we'd have people gather in a conference room and somebody would write on the whiteboard and then it's somebody's responsibility to take pictures of that and disseminate those pictures so everybody is on the same page. And it was, you know, it was necessary, it wasn't necessarily ideal. Um, and then writer would go off and do that and we'd start the process. It was, it was the, the best we could do at the time, right? We actually had a room, we have a room, it's called the hatchery to hatch ideas. Uh, and it had a wall-to-wall -wall whiteboard, massive screen, television, couches and stuff to make it comfortable. And so anybody could draw or write dialogue or, or write story beats or you know, specifics from the producer of what we've got to hit. And if we had materials to share, we could pull it up. But when we went to work from home, as Brian mentioned, now everybody has a screen using your favorite work from home tools. Uh, you can share screen, you can share an edit, you could share a drawing, you could share a script, you could just type in chat. I mean, there's so many things that suddenly we had on the plate. And, and in the beginning, it was hard for us, I think, to all sort of wrestle with um, decorum and how, how, like, it's constant. Oh, no, you, you talk. Oh, sorry, sorry. So you, you, you're done? Okay. And just all that sort of clumsiness finally fell away after, unfortunately, being in that mode for so long and we've made it work and we could bring more people because you can fit more people in a zoom call than you can a little 10 by 10 edit bay yeah. a component of that as well as you know once you're on a call like that it i think to jake's point about decorum it kind of encourages like in a in a the hatchery like a, a room where you're all working together a lot of smaller sub conversations can break out pitching about this pitching about that but the call basically necessitates that one person is speaking at a time, and it really focuses attention against what that, what that person is saying, which is really good, but maybe also for the introverts in the room like myself, it's like, ooh, it gets a little like performative when you're you know, all eyes on, but I think it probably helps everybody stay more focused to a certain degree, or it's encouraged discipline around communication in that way that's been positive. So. Yeah, I think definitely for, at least for storyboards, um, it's been a lot easier because I can just share my screen of like from the Storyboard Pro instead of me trying to be like before the meeting, five, five minutes before a meeting, like I'm trying to export this like in the PDF and like, oh no, it's the wrong format, like, let me export it again. Like, and then try and put it in like a, a folder and so I can put it up in a different program. Like there's less of that, like, um, like a bunch of like different, um, oh, Okay, unnecessary things, um, and I can uh, directly draw on top of the program to communicate what I'm trying to say in the meeting with the writers and the previous uh, and everyone else. Uh, and also, I want to add, like, I think um, during the pandemic, um, it was hard. I don't think it was easy for everyone to like adjust to the new like work style. But I would, I think, I would have to say that um, our this strike team or SFD. I think we were not that like rough, or I think we we're pretty smooth because uh, we're so used to having these situations kind of every day. <laughs> like game team would be like, oh, we need to change this and that. I just I don't know where we have to change stories. And we're so used to just adjusting to like these like new um, environments. And I think we, our um, strength really showed in this change of uh, environment. Yeah. I I think, you know, in the before days, you'd be in a meeting room and, and there's a, a responsibility to read the room. Um, and it's easier to read body language in person. It's very hard on a Zoom call. Uh, sometimes somebody's camera's not even on. You're not even sure if they're there. 
Um, but as, as these guys said, we, we did adjust. Uh, we found a made, way to make it work. And something that we picked up in that time that you know everybody working from home was we started using uh, Miro boards. And we could then pop that mirror board onto the Zoom and have everybody look at it. And you can, everybody can write on it at the same time. So you're all, it's a new way and, you know, to, to contribute ideas to, and you can do it during downtime. And then this is what I worked on uh, between our, now and our last meeting. So, uh, and we now still use the mirror boards because sometimes somebody's you know working from home, other people are in the room. We'll put it up uh, you know in a in a conference room on on the big screen, and we can still share that. And it, it is I think it's been a boon um, that we can still use mirror boards, and they still uh, you know they they help us out. Yeah, it's a big fan, big fan of that shared shared space. It really helps, uh, again, like I was mentioning in the, earlier, uh, the recall of ideas, the recall of intent, uh, suggestions, all those things. It kind of collects it all. So if we ever have to, like, say we get a sort of pivot level note from our clients and we all have to kind of go, okay, after we commiserate about, oh, man, this is going to be this is gonna be tough, we sort of reach back into the mirror board and we can see, oh, actually, that might solve this new problem we have. I'm so glad we have this here. This is great. We don't have to, like... Reinvent the wheel. Um, and also, I wanted to point out, like, when you're in uh, the same space like we are here, uh, folks like Ari, who are wonderful artists, and some of you out there are, are wonderful artists, too, you probably don't like it when somebody else just comes up and starts drawing on top of your stuff. <laughs> so Miro and Zoom and those things make that a little less uh, awkward. Right, that's awesome. We are right on time, I'm happy to say. Uh, I have pledged to offer up a little bit of opportunity for, what's? Q&A. Q&A, yes, 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 that's what I mean. It's time for Q&A, not time for everybody to move on with their lives. Um, if you've all got questions, this group would love to field them. Hi, I am also an associate producer for a cinematics team for a game company. And I also came from film and television so I'm used to, so I've been negotiating between the waterfall pipeline and the uh, strike team model, and we've evolved into the strike team model, and I'm trying to think about deadlines and targets and making sure every voice is heard, and I'm thinking, what's missing between um, the traditional waterfall planning versus the strike team scrum all in together to reach our, our deadlines? I'm trying to enhance it, but from your perspective, what do you think might be missing? So I will say we use kind of a combination of all of those on the production side of things. Mm -hmm. So while the creative process is very focused on strike teams and making sure everyone's idea is heard, in our production meetings, we're looking at the waterfall structure and where people need to get things in by and things like that. So for me, it's kind of finding that balance. I think that that's the hard thing to strike there and that is sometimes what's missing in those rooms. So that really comes down to me working with the senior producers and the director to be like, what do we need to accomplish in this room today so that we can act as more of like shepherds rather than people who are saying, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. It can be, hey, here's our goal for this meeting. Let's hit it by the end. I might tell you like for us in the previs, you know, getting involved in a strike team might mean getting involved on the production earlier than we might normally have like a previs lead available to, to staff the show. And so it does require some shuffling to make their time available. But part of the idea is that by having the previs lead available in those meetings earlier, it will pay dividends later because they're that much more plugged into the story and it saves us some iterative cycles later because they already like, they've been having conversations with the director for weeks by that point. So the idea is we see the savings later by trying to make people more available sooner. I, I think the way that I, that I think about it is that we have different tiers of like sort of oversight on the show, right? There's like a leadership tier, which is maybe structurally above a lot of us at the table, but this table is the on the ground team. So we're meeting every day to talk about the show and based on where we are in the schedule, one of these expertises is like stepping forward and it's their time and we're all kind of riding along, you know, to give input on it. But, uh, you know, structurally above that, like as a director, I'm working with other leaders about the show like every month or, you know, couple weeks or something. So it's more of that kind of tiered system. 
Thank you. Hi, I'm Nick. Um, I'm a game student, so I was wondering, how do you keep communication flowing throughout the project, and how do you communicate between different disciplines? Yeah, I think, I think the strike team setup helps us significantly with that, because that's what it used to be, was like the director would kind of own that communication flow, and the producer would kind of like support, sort of like chasing after the director, mopping up a bit. Um, but today, I think things flow a lot better, there's, I think there's just naturally part of the problem where everyone kind of cares about their discipline the most. So, I mean, that's in all fields everywhere. So um, there's that to deal with. But mostly, I think this is the best solution we've found. I, I mean, the producer in the room is also completely invaluable for documenting the conversation so that if somebody misses a meeting, they have a quick, they can catch up quickly. And just that history is really important. It's like a communication tool. So if somebody were, like to say, were new or brought onto the project, they can just get forwarded the whole history of all the story conversations to date and brought up to speed really quickly. Yeah, I was gonna say too, it is, it's incumbent on the producer in the room to make sure that everyone knows what's going on all the time. So whether that's through Slack or particularly at Blizzard, we keep an email chain with everyone who could possibly need to know what's going on updated all the time. So if we have a meeting with everyone in it, those notes will go out or those minutes will go out. And if you missed it, you're gonna read through all of it and be completely caught up by the next time we meet. I think, I think uh, also what the strike teams do for the persons in the room is it breaks down walls into like chain link fences, so yeah, edges, so we can communicate better. So we're not, a, we're not like, oh, I don't want to, it's not my place to go talk to that. Like, none of that really applies. Like, we become comfortable with each other. The disciplines don't become so locked in place. We, we're comfortable going each other's lanes to pay, pay a visit and say hello. It probably helps just establish the personal relationships that make that communication easier so that if I need to go pop into the editor's bay and ask them a question about the edit, like, we've already been in so many meetings together, I don't feel like there's a barrier that may normally exist in that space anymore. And for what it's worth, Slack channel is a incredible uh, speed the plow. Rather than have an email go out and maybe you see that email or not, you can answer instantaneously. Or it's how I, I use it as like, hey, can you come to my bay real quick? <laughs> Hi. Um, I've been in a couple of writer's strike teams recently, uh, similar to what you guys are talking about, and I was just curious, um, I wrote it down, sorry. Uh, really simple question, actually. Um, do you guys have a average number of meetings before you get to the end of the story? I know there's a due date, but um, on average, how long does it take you guys to get to the end of a story? To, to get, like, to project completion or to exit story, we, we tend to have like a milestone where we, we exit story, which means we've delivered pitch, treatment, script, animatic, and then we, well, yeah. I guess not yeah. till the end, I'm more towards uh, the writing side of it, like deciding the animatic and then getting started on production. I, I don't think there's a number. I think it's sort of like uh, the joke is that if you have all day to write a letter, it's gonna take you all day to write a letter, and I think that's, kind of what we do. We like, how much time do we have? Okay, we're gonna use that. So that's usually what happens. Yeah, our, projects, our projects schedules vary greatly depending on the client, the intent, and the medium, because we work not just in the wonderful pre-render high fidelity, we have a bunch of different mediums, and th those kind of, like Brian said, it sort of sets up the, the barrier points for how many times you can meet, because you're running out of time. And just anecdotally, we've had some that went many months, stretching on to a year, and some that it was a week, it was a sprint. It was an absolute sprint and it was done in a week, so yeah. I mean, we have cinematics that are 10 minutes long and we have ones that are 45 seconds long. So it depends on the project. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Caleb, I'm a storyboard artist, so this question is for Ari specifically. Um, are there any uh, major differences or important differences working in games versus like film and TV? Um, yeah, coming from a TV animation, I think the biggest difference is a um, lot of iterations, meaning like you kind of expect the story to change so organically that whatever you drew for the boards will maybe not be used for the next meeting or whatever. So you kind of have to ex uh, ex have that kind of expectations, which also meant that my drawings became um, more rougher 
um, some people said that it's like a mix of TV and feature style into like a game form, like into like a game medium form. So I guess it's kind of like that. But I think that was the biggest part, like a lot of iterations. But I think that's a fun part too. So yeah. I might even say not specific to storyboards, but just with our client as a game team is that they are themselves really talented creatives, but they are not generally probably also filmmakers. And so they have strong opinions about things, but may not have necessarily the language to articulate it in the way that you know we might have conversations about filmmaking. And so there is like a translation that I think the director oftentimes has to do, or to translate like just creative, emotive feedback to filmmaking feedback. Yeah, that, puts, that puts a lot of strain on the animatic to be exciting and tell a lot. So our animatics are pretty involved, but the well, boards themselves can be a lot more suggestive because it's sort of like. Well, the people we're showing it to, they know these characters are the ones who created them. We're just showing them back to them. So it just has to represent it. We don't need to be like on model because we're sending it overseas or anything like that. We, we never do that. So. Just, just to add to that, um, I've worked in a few television shows and a couple movies. Uh, the animatics we make at Blizzard are by far more complex than anything I've worked on. Now, I've been there for a while, so maybe things have changed in those places. But, but again, to that point, we're, we're, th there's a known quantity already. That's not the case uh, here. So we really have to put on a lot of bells and whistles to really make these things uh, sing in the very first stages. Thank you so much. To that and to the previous question, uh, sometimes we will get down the road on an animatic and we'll bring it to the game team, and the game team will go, oh, we're not doing that anymore. So we, we need you to, we're doing something else, so here's the new thing that we're doing, go do that. Um, and that might take us all the way back to writing. Um, but then it, you know, the whole pipeline is affected that way. So- Let me get a character cut. Oh yeah. Uh, so to, Irie has to be super agile and super quick, and she's incredibly both. Uh, another thing I wanted to add is, uh, because there's a lot of iterations, um, and also a heavy emphasis on the, I guess, the an animatic with the editor and the director, um, whatever, I guess, even the ugliest drawings I would draw for like a rough idea, they would want to put it in the animatic, so I would have to get used to seeing my ugly drawings in like a finalized animatic form, but like the fact that the, uh, the editors are uh, included in the uh, process pretty early is kind of like exciting because you get to see their magic really early and kind of see that see, see it come to life. Um, yeah, and also the fact that you can, um, you, I think at least from my experience in TV, I feel like I have a lot of um, a lot of uh, like responsibilities in like making sure the drawings will have to look good for the overseas and you know like the animation has to look good or whatnot, the layout has to look good. But here, because everyone has their own expertise, I can trust all these people. So like whatever I draw, I, I already know that it's gonna be like exponentially better in the every stage they go through. So I think that's like a really uh, good feeling to have. Wonderful, thank you. Oops. Sorry. Hi, my name is Kai. I work in the creative technologies. I actually came here because I saw Brian's post in the Discord server, the game animatics. Um, yeah, cool. So um, my question is generally about like the balance of collaboration. So one of the goals of technologies nowadays, um, and also the workflow of advanced, is actually bringing people more and more together in the creative process. Um, for example, you know, you know, no, like um, Epic, Unreal, they're doing like, pr they're trying to like advertise their parallel workflow compared to a traditional linear one. So the goal is to try to like um, get the creative people um, more together and get real time feedbacks to get like the quality of the stuff um, better. But now there also comes like challenges. You know, for example, the process of, so even now, the process of the collaboration or the process of actually exchanging ideas happens after the actual creative process. Even uh, just from what I've heard from like, learned just now by your workflow, you have meetings after the creation of like story reports and stuff, because it's hard to actually like, like someone to draw the storyboard together with the director. It, it, there will still be times when artists themselves have to spend time you know, to the, um, design and draw the storyboards by themselves. So my question will be, um, what do you guys, what's your t guys' take on this kind of situation? Um, are you trying to keep a balance between collaboration or creative? Or are you trying to actually 
push more to get more real-time feedback and collaboration going on. Uh, if I understand your question, like you're you're kind of you're saying like we're moving towards. I, I guess I'm not quite understanding the question. So like Unreal can allow everyone to get their hands in and just move things around, and we see it immediately. Is that sort of what you're you're saying? And like, yeah. would that supplant mm -hmm. our? And also because what, what I'm trying to say is uh, there's a challenge is coming from um, having more and more collaboration in the pipeline. Because if you're getting everything like real time, is it really good for artists or creatives to generate better ideas? Like, there's a is there a balance, or what's your idea on this? Yeah, I I think it's two different things. I think like if you want to make something that way, like one person could make a whole feature using Unreal, I, like they have, and I think that's great. And that way, there's like very few barriers to you getting your idea on screen. And that's really cool, but I don't think that's that's not what we do. So like I think ours is like in a different bucket, where it's we're purposely adding all these people, and then, yeah, it does slow things down. It does make it more expensive, but we think the the product is more representative of what we're trying to do. Like, yeah, I think I would say too that you know even in a space like Unreal may make it more capable and other tools in the future for like let's say previs animation effects and lighting to all be working at once, like more downstream shot centric teams, but. A lot of teams still don't want to start their work against a shot until the preceding team is far enough along that we can say we're committed to it. Like camera is really important. A lot of effects and a lot of lighting are really played to camera. And so if they start their work while the camera is still in a very volatile state in flux, they can end up throwing away a lot of work. So it, I think it's a question of efficiency. You know, they still want to wait long enough until the animation and maybe the camera are far enough along to make sure their time is utilized well. The, the analogy would be like a Swiss Army knife versus like an entire box of tools that are specialized for the thing that they're meant for. And I, I feel like our model is more like that set of tools. So everyone's got, you know, they're, it's a SWAT team of experts on a certain thing, you know? Um, sorry, uh, but, but uh, also I'm also asking about like, because let's say for example in the pipeline, you have a storyboard artist do a storyboard and then the next day you have like a meeting talking about that storyboard, yeah? So um, one of Unreal's like their goals is to, like get real time feedback. For example, if you have like one storyboard finish, you get exactly that feedback real time. Do you think that's actually good for like the creative process? Yeah, um, I, I think we're out of time, so we can chat after and we can talk about it. But I have an answer. But yeah, we'll chat. Yeah, I am sorry. I know there are more questions. We do have to give up the room, um, but. Please feel free if you if you really want your question answered. I know I'll be here for a few more minutes, and I bet some of us will be too. You can yeah, grab us so in the hall. Thank you so much for coming here. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you.